The gentleman uh, sitting next to me um, has the distinction of having worked for me as an engineer, which doesn't happen very often because uh, I've always historically tended to uh, engineer my own records. But uh, there was an occasion back in, uh, back in the uh, late 70s um, where I found myself at a studio in London called, called Nova and um, Richard was, was uh, the engineer and uh, here we are, how many, however many years later it is. Well, welcome, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what do you remember about that day? Um, being nervous, <laughs> uh, because someone said that I'd be engineering for you, and uh, it seemed like, why isn't he doing it himself, you know? It was because he's, and I was told, because he's producing and he wants to, you know? And uh, so then it was a case of, what do I do? You know, how do I start? I was told it was vocal overdubs, and, uh, so I thought, well, I'll do what I do. And then I'll ask him if that's all right. I'll ask you. And you were the, the exact opposite to what I was expecting. You were really nice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, not that your reputation had preceded you or anything. I had no idea what to expect, except I expected you know, to be in the same room as God, as it were. And uh, I probably wouldn't do too well. And uh, I said, is it OK? And you said, whatever you do. You work here, you know what works, I'll tell you if, I'll tell you if I don't like it. Oh, okay. And you didn't tell me you didn't like <laughs> yeah. it. So we got on all right. Yeah. That's great. And, uh, I, I remember um, that you, you inspired um, the, the hand clap sound that I used um, on, on the pilot record. Really? You, you, you plugged in two Dolbys in series <laughs> to, uh, as, as expanders. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we plugged in two, um, two Dolbys in re replay mode. Uh, and it just made a very, very sort of muffled, uh, dead hand clap sound. And, and then with tape echo on it, it had that, what became a sort of pilot trademark. Yeah. That, that sound. And I didn't know that roughly at the same time, uh, you, one could have purchased a DBX119 domestic expander compressor that you just turn a knob that way and does the same thing. <laughs> yeah. I found that out much later. The very first experience was as a player, school band, and um, my friend Peter Coleman, wonderful, fantastic engineer, um, he got a job out of, the, out of us in the same class, same school, Stopsley High School, and he got a job in the music business in the studio in London, Theobalds Road, CBS Studios, when it was in Theobalds Road above a clothes shop or something. The engineer there, for some reason, wanted to practice something. And so he said to Peter, you know, do you know anyone? So he said, well, I'll bring my band out. So we went up and played in CBS Studios. So that was my first experience in the studio. Um, they had a Neve console and I saw things like Blue Stripe 1176s and never looked back, you know. I had a job at British Aircraft Corporation, supposedly learning about electronics. And every Friday night, I'd get on the train and go up to London and wait till the likes of Uriah Heap finished at two o'clock in the morning and went home. And then Ashley and I would play around with their tapes. You know? We'd edit out all the, we'd copy all the guitar solos. Everything's in the same key, you know, virtually the same tempo. And uh, we'd make our own little solo tape, you know, three minutes of guitar solo, heavy metal guitar solos put them in backwards, learn how to do tape phasing, and that was it, you know, and wait for the milk train so we go back to Luton. It was through those <clears throat> visits that I got into the business because um, the person higher up in the hierarchy as a tape ops at Lansdowne, he told Ashley um, that there's a job, he'd been offered a job as a tape op at what was recorded sound to become Nova, and that he was going to turn it down because he was just, you know, be an engineer at Lansdowne. And uh, does your friend, who looks keen, was he interested, you know, good enough, so. Um, Peter Coleman and Ashley Howe 
sat me down and said, you know, you ought to do this. Go for the interview. We'll give you the answer to the two questions. You know, there'll be loads of questions, but there were two that matter. And that is, obviously, you're going to say, what are they? Um, what sort of music do you like? The answer's everything. And what other interests do you have? And the answer's nothing. But basically, that makes you available 24-7 to do anything. And that's all they're interested in at that stage. You know? And so, and lo and behold, <laughs> I was wonderful George Pastel, the late George Pastel, who was the owner-manager of Recorded Sound, uh, interviewed me and I got the job. I don't know whether I developed my style. I think my style, if there is such a thing, is what happens. I think the only thing I can consciously say that I ever wanted to do was with the opposite of what everybody else was doing and to see whether it would work, you know. And I do remember the, an ongoing question of the artist, sounds great, Richard, but could we have some reverb on it? You know, or oh, echoes we used to typically refer to it. Um, I don't know, I just I used to love it dry and just real. I think an important stage of learning, you know, the early part, the studio manager, uh, sorry, the chief engineer at Recorded Sound was a wonderful person called Mike Whale, whose dad was a bass player, Alan Whale. And uh, he said, you know, our, my job was to be the auto locator for the tape machine because, you know, in those days they didn't have clocks or anything. And yet the requests and requirements were still the same. Go back to the second chorus, or go halfway through the first verse. And without a clock or counter, you had to know where that was. And we'd use various and sundry, you know, marks on the tape, pieces of paper sticking out that would fly out as you'd go around. And um, so that was my job, was to just to be there. And within a week of being in the studio, I was told, okay, Richard, they want to replace the piano on the second chorus, it's track seven, I'll tell you when to go in, you know? And this is before the word undo, I think, was even in the dictionary, wasn't it? I mean, it's, uh, and there was no copies or anything, and so there you are, you know? Fortunately, I think I had plenty of room to get in, but not so much room to get out. Getting in's easy, getting out's hard. And I uh, got away with that. And that was my job, you know, and learning what the engineer wanted. To walk into the room, well, how he wanted it set, what he wanted to see. And uh, so I learned how to line up the echo return so they'd be compatible, minus six on one side and zero on the other and all that sort of stuff. And patching a tape delay to the tape machine. Well, uh, a wonderful ex example of that was um, around about 89, I guess. I'm working at Jeff Lynn's home in uh, the area outside of Birmingham, uh, a lovely 500-year-old home, well, then, you know, 500-year-old beam and everything. And it's just he and I, all of his talent and whatever ability I had to bring to the party. But, you know, this is one man doing all this stuff, you know, and he's... He's come to the stage where we've got to do vocals because everything else we've <laughs> every, everything else is on the track, and which means you've got to write some words. <laughs> and so he's in this <laughs> lyric writing stage. Actually, I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit there. He's very well prepared most of the time, but some things he does leave to the last minute. Extremely talented man. But on this occasion, he was struggling for a word. You know, and he was out loud struggling for a word. And I made the mistake of saying, how about, and he goes, you bastard. I said, what? He said, that's, that's, that's it. I said, well, well, well then, what's the problem? <laughs> he said, well, because you said it, no, I can't use it. Why can't you use it? He said, well, you know, because you're going to want some of the writing. And as well. and I said, yeah. So unfortunately, we had to come to a little agreement there, you know, it's like, if I can't say what I think, then I can't be me, you know. And if it came down to it, you know, how many number one records has he written? You know, if I went to court and said, I wrote that word on that song, who are they going to believe, you know? Come on, it's him and me. So we had that understanding that it was okay under some circumstances for me to voice <laughs> an opinion, you know, but I had to ask first. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but usually, uh, going back, I, I guess from my nickname that, again, Mike Whale gave me, Yes But was my nickname, because <laughs> I would never accept what they were telling me as the definitive answer. 
And my way of getting my ideas through is, oh yeah, that's all very well. But how about, you know, yes, but, you know. The, the fear is gone. The adrenaline factor is somewhat lower, of course, because of that. Um, undo, save it, you know, that old joke of, I need another track, you know. Uh, isn't a joke anymore. It's like you, there's no limit to how many tracks. There's a difference in mindset. Uh, the anticipation is less. Uh, the regret doesn't exist. You know, it's very rare that somebody will make a mistake on pro with a system like Pro Tools in a DAW um, that isn't recoverable. I uh, was asked by Rick Rubin's secretary to, uh, if I'd be prepared to mix a f couple of songs for Rick. They sent me a drive, I listened to the songs, and during the process I realised it was a shootout. And I wasn't that so much interested in a shootout because I didn't know who else was involved. To that point, I actually hadn't been much of a fan of the Dixie Chicks. Uh, I appreciate what they've done, and, uh, and in fact, I also appreciate that their records seem to be getting better, it, or sorry, more to my liking and my taste. So anyway, so there's this shootout thing, and I wasn't sure I wanted to do that. And so uh, before I turned it in, I actually turned it down, um, respectfully turned it down. I'd actually returned the drive, but you know, in this day and age, I'm not returning the masters because I'm not going to work off a firewire drive when I can work off an internal, so I copied it all. So I still had it all. And I sent, you know, what I had. And Anyway, Rick called me back a few days later and said, you know, I really want you to have a go at this. Please do it. So I still had it, so I said, OK. So I did them, and then he got the others in, and apparently he liked my one best, and so then I got the job. And uh, the rest is... Two Fortune. Grammys later, <laughs> or several Grammys later. Yeah, I, they, they got five, <laughs> and I, on that night, I got three. Should have been four. No, <laughs> I say that, actually, because they won the only category that has an official mastering Grammy, right? That's album of the year. So it's there, it's in the program, mastering, da, da, and there's my name, you know, engineer Richard Dodd, mastering Richard Dodd. Yeah? They wouldn't give me the other Grammy. Cheap. <laughs> when I'm mixing, I uh, try and mix without anything on the two bars. Now, I've been through a phase of always trying to make it sound finished, but that was before the level war. You know, I wanted it to be that. Uh, when the mastering engineers had rules that they had to abide by, you know, no reds, no overs, and before we had the devices that automatically suppress the reds, as it were, and all the peaks. Now I'm a mastering engineer as well, so I do it, you know. Uh, volume wins. Uh, any contest, except audio file, of course, except somebody that actually cares what it sounds like. But uh, in all other instances, the real world instances, uh, volume wins. So it's, no, it's not going to go away. You still, to this day, you can send something to somebody with ears. And if they've got two to compare, they're still going to pick the loudest. It's very rare, unless it's really crunchy and distorted, unless they've done a really bad job of getting it loud. You know, just slap a, an L whatever on it, you know, um, which happens frequently. Um, volume wins. The unfortunate thing is, as a mastering engineer, the engineers are faced with having to convince somebody that the thing's finished and as good as everybody else's record, which is volume. So they not only send a version that is peak limited and maximized to the max, that uh, they actually print the mixes like that too, because they've mixed that way. And this is this whole thing of no one takes a chance anymore because no one makes a decision anymore, sorry, because, you know, they don't have to. Um, shrink that never gets around it anymore. It's always in, you know, update the download or whatever. It's, uh, 
it's a terrible thing because the poor engineer is faced with five or six different people, some of them relevant, most of them not, telling him to just raise this, just raise that, and now you've done that, just turn that up. And the only way they can do that, having given them the max, the only way they can do that is to just overdo it. Just say, sure, I've got that limiter there, I can turn that up, turn that up, turn that up, dial it in, let my assistant do it, you know, because they're not paying me for this. And then the record company demands, uh, you know, of your time, of the budget, all this academic BS that uh, has to go in here. You know, Sony actually now want you to write the name of every musician on the audio file, you know? Pay somebody to be at the session to do that. You know, that's not our job, you know? But um, someone's decided, and you can only deliver it in a certain format because that's the only way that it'll in, go into their system. You know, you can't send them a tape because you could, you know, how are they going to get that into their backup system? The nice thing about mastering is that sometimes people afford that at the end of their bedroom project. They'll think, well, maybe we'll go to a decent mastering thing and get it finished. And sometimes it's a good job they did, you know. Um, but you, you get to hear things that you otherwise wouldn't. If you relied on the major labels to hear what talent's out there, bless them, they've got to keep their profit margin up. You know, they've got shareholders and stuff. They need to make what's produce what sells, you know, and sometimes that's nothing to do with the ability. It's a good job some of these auto tuners don't sweat because I'd need a bucket underneath the Pro Tools, I tell you. It's, it's, uh, it's hard work. There's not much talent being recognized by major labels. You know, the talent is all, seems to have to be doing it themselves, and God bless them. You know, a lot of them are doing a good job. I've been in the fortunate position of having to decide whether I want to do this great thing or this great thing. So I guess I have been choosy. You know, I've, the answer's been yes. You know, George Harrison says, oh, I'm thinking about making, would you like to engineer? How long do you think about that? You know, a millisecond? You know, Roy Orbison's coming in. Do you, you want to do, you know, like another nanosecond? It's, um, yeah, Tom Petty says, you, uh, Richard, you, thank you very much. Yeah, there have been some really tough, tough choices. But yeah, there's been stuff I turned down, the stuff that gets sent to me now, mastering. And, uh, you know, your money, even if you spent time, sometimes you do, you've got to spend an hour before you can even hear it, you know, comes in in such a fashion. And then you get to hear it, and it's like, send it, sorry, I think somebody else might be more suitable. You know? That's the thing. I don't know whether you've touched on in your interviews, but you know, mixing now, when someone sends you a project, it takes you a day before you can even listen to it. I had, a, I had an artist, uh, you know, he, he, here's a track, I'm just going to play it to you. Oh, oh, well, that guitar track shouldn't be in, and this shouldn't be, and that's not meant to be there and stuff. Some genius said, consolidate the files and send them to him. And what they missed out is like, make sure that it's appropriate to consolidate the files. You know, like those quick edits that somebody did on the comp that click every time? Consolidate it, send it to him. So now you have files riddled with clicks. Someone decided to strap an auto-tune as it comes up, generic default, on the vocal, knowing that it's going to be tuned later. Nope, sorry. The other person goes, oh, what about bounce it with that in. You know, so you got this really obvious nasal thing going on. I use auto-tune as the generic, whether it's Melodyne or whatever, you know, whatever program, or tuning program that they use. And it's just, um, auto-tune is the, the one that people use to slap on there and just let it go, you know? And it gets, finds its way onto the record because that's all the mixing engineer has. And then because of today, you get it and you think, this has been a bit, like, well, maybe the talent wasn't there. Maybe it had to be done because it so often does. You know, you're in Nashville. There's uh, a few artists here that won't go near auto-tune. You know, you're at McBride Studio, Martina. You won't allow anything like that, you know, not to be mentioned in the room. And she doesn't need it, that's why. She, she has the, the kit to be able to say that. And there are other people, you know, I don't want anyone to hear this without the auto-tuner on. There's, I'm, I'm not against that, you know, but 
that's a facility, the same as an equalizer or anything else. Mm -hmm. That's hopefully to improve on an existing mass of talent, not to make something available that shouldn't be available. You know, like a two-headed dog or something, you know? That's my opinion. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. It's all analog, really, as long as there's a human involved. God bless him, even Elvis, they use a razor blade, you know? Terrific, thank you so much. My pleasure. That's great. Good.